with all of you today. So in Silicon Valley, my nickname is Captain Hoff. They call me that because I'm the captain and chairman of Founderspace. And Founderspace is an incubator and accelerator. We work all over the world with startups, helping them go to market, raise capital, uh, actually pioneer new technologies. And right now, Founderspace, let's see if this works, yep. Founderspace was rated the number one accelerator for overseas startups here in Silicon Valley by Forbes Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. We really focus on a global perspective. So we're working all over the world. Right now, uh, we have over 50 partners in 22 countries. I spend about 60% of my time traveling, so I'm not in the Bay Area that much. Uh, but our mission has actually been to empower startups all over the world, give them access to new technologies, and really teach them. That's the fundamental thing. So we do a lot in China right now. Right now in China, uh, we are working in every major tier one and tier two city, running programs, working with entrepreneurs, helping exchange between China and the US, and also doing a lot in Europe. So um, I'm also the author of the book, Make Elephants Fly. It is all about the process of radical innovation. So I've spent my life working with startups, helping them innovate, and the elephant is the, their big idea. It's the big idea that you want to get off the ground that you think is impossible. And in the book, I actually show how entrepreneurs step by step go through that process. Today, I'm going to talk about biohacking and mind technology. So uh, we all, all of us um, have had our brains for a long time, right? Our brains haven't changed for over 100,000 years. However, the world has. So if you can imagine, our brains are the same brains our ancestors had when they were living in caves. But right now, all of us live in a very complex society. That means our brains are extremely malleable. They can adapt, they can learn, like if you took one of our prehistoric ancestors and set them in today's world, they would be baffled. But for us, smartphones and everything else seem a natural part of our lives. Well, the question I'm asking here is where are we going next? With new technology, what will happen to our minds? So I see new technology as actually us taking a role in our own evolution. We're already seeing in the world today that technology is allowing human beings to actually control our future. We're doing it with CRISPR and DNA editing. So right now, we can actually alter our DNA. We know the code for, human, for the creation of life on this planet. And we are doing that actively with plants, we all, knew, we all know that we are breeding new species of plants that have more flavor, that can live in harsher climates. But what a lot of people don't realize is we're also doing it with animals. At the University of Florida, they're actually developing cows now with altered DNA using CRISPR that can survive in extremely hot climates. Why are they doing this? Because of climate change. What happens when we start to apply these new technologies to our brain? Well, right now, I'm working with a number of startups that are doing brain-computer interfaces. So what is a brain-computer interface? It actually is a technology that allows you to, to access your brain waves. Let me give you some examples. So right now at Duke University, uh, they have implanted a chip into a monkey's brain. And that chip allows the monkey, just by thinking, to control a robotic arm and feed itself. That's pretty amazing. Um, another experiment they've run 
is with the chip in the monkey's brain, they placed it in an electric wheelchair. And just by thinking, the monkey could learn to drive and steer that wheelchair. So if you think about it, today, if you have a chip in your brain, you, we, you would be able to sit in a car and potentially drive the car. You would be able to turn off and on the lights. You would be able to control robots. That technology is here right now. Back one. So another experiment at Duke they ran is even more fascinating. They have two rats. One is called the encoder rat. The other is the decoder. These rats are actually not in the same room. They are in uh, different cities connected through the internet. Each of the rat has a chip in their brain. That chip, as you can see, is wired to the internet. When the first rat is shown where to get food, it is shown a light so that it can go and get food. The second rat doesn't know where this food is or when it will appear, but it is, it is connected to the first rat's brain. Guess what happens? It learns how to get the food. That signal from one rat's brain is transmitted to the other rat. What does that tell us? It is possible by wiring our brains together to actually transfer information, to actually transfer knowledge. They did an even more advanced experiment at Duke University. They had three monkeys with chips in their brain. Each of these monkeys can only see in two dimensions, 2D. So they, but the monkeys together are rewarded with a treat, with some good food, if they can move a dot on the computer screen in 3D space to the right location. Well, each of these monkeys can't do it alone because they can only see 2D. They can't even move in 3D. But together, all three of those brains learn how to work together to consistently move the dot to the right 3D location. That, tech, that, act, that finding is actually amazing. What it is telling us is that when multiple brains are wired together, they can perceive the world in a way that a single brain might not be able to do. They are collectively working as a single intelligence. Now, the monkeys aren't consciously aware that they are wired to other monkeys' brains. They don't have to know that. They are actually just getting the information and perceiving it intuitively. At UC Berkeley, they're using fMRI to do brain recording. Now, what's amazing about this experiment right here is what they're doing is looking at the blood flow in the brain and interpreting that blood flow. They're actually extracting information from that. So what they did is they had the patient in the fMRI machine watch a video or look at a photo. And then they try to extract that information and tell just by looking at the brain what's in the, the patient's head. Now, in this clip right here, you can see the actual video. This is what they recorded in, from their head. That is very crude resolution, but you can actually make out the image. So that's telling us we have the technology now to actually look into your head and see what you are seeing, seeing images that are formed in your brain. This is not the only experiment done with this. They've done a similar experiment at the University of Toronto with EEG technology, which is a very portable, lightweight brain cap. Now, EEG technology, this is it. So this is a startup using EEG. See that band around the head? That's all you need. And a number of startups are using this technology right now to do things like brain fitness, help you meditate, tell you when you're stressed out. They're using it to send commands. I've been talking to these startups and they have now figured out that with simple EEG technology, you can actually think something and turn on, let's say, a drone and make it go up and down. Now, it's still very simple. 
We're at the very first stages of this. But in today's lecture, I want to show you the future, where we may go with this technology in the coming 10, 20, and 30 years. So a new technology is coming on board, and it's called quasi-ballistic photons. Basically, those are beams of light that they uh, shoot through your skull and can actually map out your brain. Facebook announced they want to try to use this technology in the next few years to allow you to message on your phone just by thinking. Elon Musk has a startup called Neuralink. Elon Musk's goal is not to put a chip into your brain, but to actually inject what he calls a neural lace into your brain that forms an interface as if you had a chip in your brain so that you can do advanced connection to the internet. Now, we all know Elon Musk is worried about AI taking over the world. And his belief is that if you can't beat them, join them. So he wants to basically connect people's brains to the internet so that we and AI merge together. At Brown University, they have, a, they have what they call brain gate. And this is where they're actually implanting these chips that I showed you in the monkeys into human brains. Now, would any of you get a chip in your brain? Raise your hand. Not many people are raising their hand, okay? But if you were this woman, you would, because she is completely paralyzed. Her entire body is paralyzed. She has what's called locked-in syndrome. You can get it from a stroke, and it's totally debilitating. But with this chip in her brain, she can actually, like the monkey, control a robotic arm and feed herself. So it radically improves the quality of her life. Now, you may get a chip in your brain in the future. You may just not know it. But this is a grain of rice. And you see this little device here that is tiny compared to the grain of rice? That is a new, uh, new, the sm world's smallest computer made by IBM. I point this out because the chip in your brain may be so small, you don't even know it's there. So let's talk about the day when we connect our brain to the internet. What is going to happen? And I tell you, this day will come. It is coming. It is already happening. So first thing you would probably be able to do is download knowledge. So all of us have used Alexa or Google Home. If you're in Silicon Valley, I assume you have. And you know, we ask for information when we need it. Well, the next step would be a Google, an Alexa or Google Home in your brain, where you simply think something and the information comes. It could get even more advanced than that. You might not have to learn another language. You may be able to download that language into your head. There may come a time where actually going to university feels so archaic. People actually sat around for years and studied when you can just access all the world's information and download it into your brain. And what you can't download, you can just store in the cloud and access it. <laughs> Who would go to a university? Somebody in the future is going to be developing an operating system for the brain. And that is going to radically change the world. We all know right now the world is dominated by companies like Apple and Google, who made the operating system for our latest devices, you know, the mobile phone, before that Microsoft with the PC. There will come a time when there's an operating system for the brain. And I tell you, the big tech companies are all thinking about this. Share memories. So not only will you be able to download information in the future, everything is information in your head. Everything can be put into information. So if you have an experience, you could share it with your loved ones. You could share it with coworkers. People could share each other's information. So for example, Instead of going skydiving, if I'm afraid to go skydiving, I could actually sh get that whole experience from somebody who has done it. 
synchronizing minds. As I showed you with the monkeys, we will actually be able to start to synchronize our own thoughts. Now, what will that mean for humanity when, when each of us is actually part of a greater mind? Think about this. We might be, it will not only be our minds, it will be AI. So we'll have very powerful AI out there working in conjunction with billions, potentially billions of minds wired into one giant network. Live outside your body. <laughs> so once you are connected to all these people, with, uh, when your brain has a high-speed connection to the internet, it doesn't matter where you are. I could potentially uh, connect to you, and you may be in another, another city and actually see what you're seeing through your eyes. Or if the, if the speed of light is not a barrier, I could actually connect to somebody on another planet <laughs> and actually experience that planet through that person. But I not only can connect to people, I could connect to robots. Think about it. With a high-speed connection, I could virtually inhabit a robot in, and go under the sea and explore under the sea I could f or on another planet. And if that robot has sensors, whatever that robot senses, I could perceive. So whatever feelings, sensations, even senses that we physically don't have, such as the perception of UV light. Or like a bat, if it could detect sonar, we could, we could see or hear with sonar. All of this will potentially be possible as we advance as a civilization. Now the scary part. <laughs> it's bad enough to have your iPhone hacked or have a phishing scam online where your identity is stolen. But if they hack your brain, it's not just your driver's license and social security number, it's your actual identity that could be stolen. Literally, a brain hacker could get into your brain and rewrite the information that's there. They could literally give you a new past. They could literally control you without you knowing it. So this technology is not all, you know, fun and roses. There's a dark side to, to, to the light side. And all of us actually need to consider that now. Do we want to give Facebook access to our brain? We all know we can trust Facebook. They've proven that many times over. Do we want to give them our most intimate thoughts? Uh, so. My question to you is this technology is coming whether you like it or not, right? It is coming. As we know with all technologies, when they come, you cannot stop them. The genie is out of the bottle. The real question is how will we use this technology? Will we use it responsibly? And not just individuals, but corporations and governments. And actually, now is the time when we need to be having these discussions. We can't have these discussions after the technology is already out there and being used because then it could be too late. We need to start thinking about this now and understanding the ramifications of our decisions and especially the entrepreneurs out there, the venture capitalists out there have a deep responsibility when it comes to this technology. Thank you so much.